Yeah, it's an absolute delight to launch John Golling's History of the Built World. Um, this show has now been touring both in Australia, across Australia, and we also toured it to India a couple of years ago now, um, obviously just before COVID hit, so it was in three exhibitions over there, and I had the absolute delight and pleasure to travel to India with John. So I can definitely tell you a few little anecdotes. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. What I actually might start with, we did a publication of the exhibition too, and they will be shipped up here, um, but I wanted to actually read a quote from John because he is such a significant photographer. He has been exploring the built environment throughout his entire career. He did start as in the architecture department, <laughs> as well as photography. Um, but he says, architecture, the mother of the arts, exerts a privileged claim on our collective respect. Globally and throughout history, architecture exists alongside the highest expressions of human endeavor. It codifies in built form a society's values, transcending utility, transcending style, style uh, transcending time and place. I'm a photographer of architecture. My purpose is to identify the quintessential elements and intrinsic dignity of architectural works, ancient and modern, and to convey the sometimes nebulous attributes through the palpable visual power of form. I try to encapsulate this in a single image. And it is really what John has done throughout his entire career, is try to capture in one photograph what that building is about. Uh, um, architects have been using John throughout his entire career. He actually started in fashion. And what he talks about in fashion is that uh, he's the director of taking the photographs. He tells people what to do but for a building, it's the building that becomes the director. The building tells him how to photograph it. So architects basically ask him to photograph these buildings and they do that because he really does, he takes out elements that are not intrinsic to the building itself. So I'll take you around, I'm trying to find it, um, but there's one where he actually, oh, the one behind up here, if we look up here, this building, he, so this building is on the foreshore in Victoria. And what he did is he removes the ugly bits that the architect didn't actually want. So you know those like the big pipes on the top of a building where they decide to put air vents? Um, he actually removes that from the image. So again, he's a complete innovator. He's been innovating his entire life. He actually started when he was about nine years old and he found a camera and he fell in love with the camera and how it worked. So he loves the tech and he's been a techie his entire life. He would probably never call himself that. Um, but he really understands how to take a photograph, how the camera works. And he has an archive of over half a million photographs, most digitized. Um, and this show actually um, the curator, the original curator was Stephen Zagala, who left us just after the show launched. He's now in Adelaide. Um, but they went through, you know, it was half a million images really to try to find something which looked at his practice. And he has, I guess, some people see it as a dual practice, but I actually see it as one of the same thing. He has both a commercial, but he also has a practice that looks at the cultural heritage of a site. So these are obviously many of his commercial imagery. But this one here is probably the start or something that sort of gives you an idea of his interest in how humans inhabit the world through the buildings. So this is actually every, um, where is, uh, this is all down the strip in Surface Paradise. And he basically went and photographed it down the street. So he's in like a car or he's in, you know, going down and just taking the photograph. The one over here, and if you walk around here, this is every high rise along the Gold Coast. So this, and so he went and he photographed every single high rise at this point in time. Obviously, I'm sure it's altered since that point. Um, but you can see that he's photographed every single building. And I will give you a little bit of a tip. It's sort of like, where's Wally? 
you have to find the duplicates. I think he accidentally put in two duplicates in here, but he did order it by size, so your eye actually reads it as something quite coherent. Um, but yeah, I test you, try to find the replicas. Um, we might go down to this one over here. This one is one of my favourites. This, of course, doesn't actually exist. There were no kangaroos jumping down um, a Melbourne street. But this is fascinating about the way he um, constructs a photograph, which typically, like, you would think this would be photoshopped. This is before Photoshop. So what he did is, I think it was an anecdote he talks about in Italy, they said to him, oh, so you have kangaroos in the streets? And he got so sick of people sort of saying, yeah, the whole streets are occupied by kangaroos. He went, okay, this is gonna be hilarious. So he went and photographed a streetscape and then got permission to go photograph kangaroos at the Melbourne Zoo. And then he, in his dark room and in camera, actually composed this. So this is before Photoshop. This is an innovator. And that's what John is fantastic in doing. He does alter the photograph um, in order for it to tell you the narrative that he's telling. And these buildings are telling a narrative. They're talking about how people occupy the space. They're talking about a period in time, and they're talking about something that's architecturally significant. Um, this is a fantastic building um, in Melbourne. It's uh, the MTC and the MRC is just around there, the Melbourne Theatre Company. Um, and again, he's trying to tell the story of the building and these amazing architectural forms. And that's why architects love him, because he's able to tell that story. Um, this is Acker, and I did work here for many years, so I know this building quite well. Um, and this is what the building looks like, but there are aspects of it which you can see which he has pulled, stretched, and elongated the perspective a little bit to tell the story of the building. If we go around here, what we might begin to see is his um, international flair. So I, this one, this building, I love that this building exists. Uh, it's a lotus, obviously. It's supposed to be a lotus flower. Um, it is in China, and this is right on a river there. But again, it's like this amazing architectural form where you sort of go, how does this exist? How does this architect come up with it? It's magical. Um, again, another magical building. This is in New Zealand. Um, sorry, New Caledonia. Is that right? Yep. Amazing glass forms. But if we turn around, you'll begin to see the ancient sites. So the second part of his practice is to look, go into these ancient areas, and he's spent a long time in India over the years. And what he's done is he's been going back there basically every single year, really up until COVID, uh, to document sites of significance specifically in India. He's also travelled across the world into Cambodia and so forth. But um, his relationship with India has been so significant. He went, in there, uh, went there in the 80s and every single year he's been going back there. He is doing a project about documenting every single step well in India and these are, oh, these are beautiful and there's, I think there's actually one around the corner. Um, but these sites of significance are, again, documenting what he calls as dead cities. This is about uh, the fall and rise and rise and fall of civilizations. So many of these civilizations, if we go around the corner, you'll see no longer exist in the current form. And he really is looking at these sites of significance. So this is a temple in Hampi in India, and he's been going back to Hampi um, throughout his entire career. And again, if you want to throw me a question, please ask me. <laughs> um, but these sorts of sites, um, he's very interested in what it says about humanity. And he's very political in his work. If you actually listen to him, he's very political. He's a bit of an activist. Um, but he is looking at, I guess, how the fall of civilization occurs. Because a lot of these things are affected by 
uh, empires that begin to disintegrate because of a political unrest. And that could be, um, he often refers to Trump and the downfall of America. And he sees this as a continuum in society. And he sees this as being reflected within the buildings themselves. Because these are, if we walk around the corner, these amazing uh, historical monuments um, like uh, Angkor Thom in Cambodia. Um, you have here a stupa in China. You have this uh, fantastic uh, architectural forms that ha are just remnants of society. And that's what he's really interested in documenting. He also puts himself often into works. Um, but typically, if you notice, there are no people. And he edits people out. And I'm trying to find the work now. But there's one work which, uh, which he, he basically photographed this site hundreds of times. And it was a site where you had tourists everywhere. There was not one point in the ground where there wasn't a person. And so what he did is he photographed the whole thing and he sliced and edited, the, edited them out. And there's this section in it, and I'll have to find it. There's a section in it where he forgot and he got a bit tired and bored and forgot to take out these few people. So there's like a section where they still exist. Is it? Where am I? Oh no, they are there. There's this amazing one, and I, I can't see it on the wall. There's this fantastic one where he just like he gets. And actually, an anecdote: when we were in, um, we went to uh, when we toured it to India. We were in Mumbai, and we went to Elephanta, and there are people everywhere. And he gets so frustrated that there's people in his shot, and he's going, oh my God, why are there so many people here? Get out of my way. So he, he loves to actually document the built environment, you know, because he finds that as soon as you insert people in, you know, there's people taking photographs and selfies of themselves, and so he really wants to document the site. Um, there are little hints, though, that there is contemporary society within them. If you look here, so this is a place in <laughs> this is a place in Libya, and you can see here that there's like this one little you know electric pole with lights and you can see the wires in. Um, often he will edit those things out. Uh, and that's I think fantastic. At the moment he's working on this project where he's trying to document uh, a, I guess a cityscape where people are not there, but it's of a site which will always have people. And it's right in the city centre of Melbourne. And so he basically takes a million shots and then slices them again and again and again. And some of these you would not know, and you can't tell that he's actually altered the image, but it really is about the building itself. Um, He's done a, a project in particular um, in a really special uh, indigenous site in Australia. And we will actually go to these ones over here. Um, so John was really one of the first non-indigenous people to go to the site. Um, he often accesses sites on helicopters, and he spent a career um, hanging out the windows of helicopters um, and nearly dying in the process many times. Um, but this one was, a, it's an amazing site. Uh, that's uh, the elder, the female there, staring out, uh, which permitted him to be on the site. But what this does is it sort of challenges, I guess, what people think about these indigenous sites, because this was actually altered. People think that these sites weren't, that they weren't changed, they weren't excavated, they weren't changed by the indigenous population, but they did. So they've found evidence. This is one of the oldest sites I've ever found, one of the oldest um, cave paintings I've ever been able to document. And what they found is the people actually altered them. So they constructed some of these columns to create what we would probably consider a church-like state. Um, and so you can actually see that they have constructed these 
to tell the and to be a site of significance for the population. This does challenge people's perceptions and understanding of how these sites were made, constructed, occupied, um, and they're just gorgeous. Um, he is uh, an artist who uses light brilliantly. And I think if you begin to look at these works, he has a way to compose his imagery. So he, he calls it a dumb composition, which is not nice, but <laughs> he describes it that way. And you'll see that he does a horizon line pretty much there. If you look at the images, he can strike horizon line here. He'll have the hero building, the object um, right in the middle. And he'll often use reflection. He'll often have something sort of reflecting the building back into itself. You can see um, in the Taj Mahal, he's done a similar sort of thing. But he also tries to take it in a slightly different way, because this is the back end of the Taj Mahal. You know, these are ways to sort of look at how to document a building in a really unique way. And that's why he's so special. And he also uses light. So he often will take a photograph at dawn or dusk because what he likes to do is give it an atmospheric um, sensibility around it. Um, but sometimes, like there, you feel the graininess. And if you look at this, you can feel the graininess of the light on the building. And it does begin to give it that little, you know, it gets you somewhere. Because it takes you somewhere. And I think for John, it, his work takes you somewhere. And it means something. And these are beautiful, beautiful buildings um, but are telling the story of society.